Chapter twenty nine of the Holy Land and Syria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Holy Land and Syria by Frank G. Carpenter. Across the Lebanon Mountains by Rail. It seems almost sacrilegious to travel by rail over the highways of the Bible. The iron tracks are laid in the pathways of the prophets, and the ghosts of the saints may be roused by the shriek of the locomotives. The modern traveler can cover in a few hours by rail distances that were several days' journey in the times of our Lord. My first railroad trip in the Holy Land was from the port of Jaffa up the mountains of Judea to the city of Jerusalem. My second was on the Mecca road from the lower end of the Sea of Galilee through the great plains of the Haran to Damascus, over the mountains of Lebanon to Beirut, on the Mediterranean Sea. During the latter trip I went from Rayak, in the valley of Lebanon, between the two ranges of mountains, along the road which has been built northward through the Koli Syria to Aleppo. All of these roads are comparatively new, and some are still building. The Mecca line now runs as far south as Medina, where Mohammed came after his flight from Mecca, and where his tomb is. That city has something like 40,000 people, and is one of the most fanatical of the Muslim centers. It will be the chief stopping place on the way to Mecca. Mecca lies about 250 miles still farther south, and the track is being laid toward that point. When the first surveys were made, there were two Christian civil engineers in the surveying party but the people were so intolerant that these men were kept hidden the greater part of the time and did their work inside the tents they were not allowed to spy out the land to see or be seen the bedouins are now causing the contractors considerable trouble the road will take a large part of the pilgrimage traffic which it has been estimated is worth to arabia some ten million dollars a year much of the money goes to the owners of the camels and the leaders of the caravans who are bedouins during the building of the road many of these have been employed in the construction and in supplying the other laborers with food as the present work has neared its completion many of the bedouins have lost their jobs they are objecting to the railway and have torn up the tracks in many places the result is a great unrest which threatens to cause serious disturbance the traffic on the constantinople damascus and mecca railways will be made up largely of men on their way to worship at mecca and medina now with nothing but camels to carry them it is estimated that about four hundred thousand go there every year and it is believed that the railway will increase the traffic from fifty to one hundred per cent christians and other unbelievers will not be carried to the holy cities although they may make tours to petra and other parts of arabia this mecca railway will have special accommodations for mohammedans certain of the carriages will be fitted up as mosques so that the travelers can perform their devotion during the journey the praying carriages will be luxuriously furnished the floors will be covered with persian carpets and around the sides will be painted verses from the quran in letters of gold a chart will indicate the direction of mecca so that the faithful can always face the right way when praying and there will also be a minaret on the top of the car six and a half feet high the mecca road is a narrow gauge with french rolling stock the material has been imported from europe the ties being of iron to withstand the white ants which eat anything wooden one of the great difficulties of construction has been the lack of water the road goes for long stretches through the desert and many of the trains carry large tanks to keep the boilers full i traveled over a part of the mecca road on my way from the holy land north to damascus leaving tiberias in the early morning i was rowed by four lusty syrians across the sea of galilee to samak which is the station on the lower end of that sea and the place where a branch line runs off to haifa from there northward we skirted the east side of the sea of galilee passing the hills upon which our saviour preached 
we rode up the valley of the Yarmuk, a stream almost as large as the Jordan, which loses itself in the Jordan farther south. We climbed the foothills of Lebanon, and at about 3,000 feet above the surface of the Sea of Galilee, reached the rich plain of Haran, the great breadbasket of the Bedouins. It grows wheat and other grain, and the land near the track was covered with poppies, golden daisies, and wild red hollyhocks. We could see Bedouin camps everywhere. These nomads live in brown tents so low that the people have to stoop to get in. Outside each little group of tents was an enclosure for the stock, and on the lands nearby cattle and camels were grazing. As we traveled we could see great flocks of black goats feeding on the sides of the Lebanon mountains. They hung to the cliffs, looking much like flies on the wall. There were also droves of black cattle and many flocks of fat-tailed white sheep. The cars were crowded with Turks, Syrians, and Bedouins, but on the advice of a friend I gave the conductor a dollar, and in return had a compartment all to myself. Bakshish will do anything in Syria. At Shamas, my guide puts it, the franc is the wheel upon which the world goes round. This road to Damascus, beginning with the branch line to Haifa, skirts the edge of Mount Carmel, where Elijah lived in a cave and where he contended with the four hundred and fifty prophets of Baal and caused their destruction. It goes up the plain of Estrelon, where the fair Jezebel lived, and over which Jehu galloped to Jezreel on his race for the throne. It takes you in plain sight of Mount Tabor and under the hills of Nazareth, where the Savior's boyhood and young manhood were spent. It crosses the spot where Jael was camping when Sisera came and she lulled him to sleep to drive the tent peg into his forehead. Then it goes on up to Damascus over a route which was probably traveled by Abraham, David, and Solomon, and by St. Paul when he was blinded by the great light. The road to Jerusalem goes over the plains where the Israelites fought with the Philistines, through the country of Samson, which I have already described, and near the place where David, with his little stone, slew the great Goliath. The railway from Damascus to Beirut shows you Mount Hermon, so famed in the Psalms, and passes numerous places, which, according to the Mohammedans, were the homes and tombs of the prophets. Take, for instance, Suk Wadi Baroda, a little valley oasis on the way to Baalbek, made up of flat-roofed mud houses surrounded by orchards and vineyards. It is mentioned by Josephus and is referred to in St. Luke as the home of the Tetrarch Lysanias. The Mohammedans say that Adam lived in the mountain which looks down upon it, and that it was near the oasis itself that Cain became jealous of Abel and slew him. I have always thought that Abel was killed with a club, although I see now that the Bible does not mention the weapon used in the murder. The Moslem legend says it was a stone. The story is that Adam had divided the world into two sections, and had given one of them to each of his boys. They had marked out their respective sections with stones, when a dispute arose concerning the boundary line. Cain claimed that Abel was inching on him, whereupon hot words passed and Cain threw a rock and struck Abel in the temple and killed him. According to the Moslem tradition, Cain was filled with remorse. He did not know what to do with his dead brother, so he took the body on his back and carried it with him over the world for five hundred years. At the end of that time he returned to this mountain, where he saw two birds fighting. At last one killed the other and then washed and buried the one slain. Cain did likewise with Abel, and straightway there sprang up seven oak trees, which are pointed out to this day. According to the same authorities, Seth, Adam's son, who took the place of Abel, lived on the western slope of the Lebanon range, and his tomb is still there. A mosque is built over it, and the tomb may be seen through an iron grating. It is eighty feet long, but the people living in the village say that it was too short, and that Seth's legs had to be doubled up in order to fit. Not far away is the tomb of Noah, which is forty feet longer. It also has a mosque connected with it. The distance from Damascus to Beirut is ninety-one miles. 
Travelers are advised not to take the third class, and women should always go first class. The third class has compartments eight feet wide running across the cars at right angles with the engine. Each compartment has two cushioned benches facing each other. Its sides are walled with windows, and there is a door at each end. The conductor does not go through the cars, but collects the tickets from the outside, walking along a running board which extends the full length of the car, and holding on to an iron rail fastened to the outside some distance above the step. The road is picturesque and gives magnificent views of the Lebanon mountains. The track winds its way up and down the hills, and the western side of the range is so steep that the cars are taken up on cogs after the same manner as on Pikes Peak, Mount Washington, and the Rigi. There are 25 stations, mostly two-story buildings of stone. The passengers are the conglomerate mixture of humanity found in this part of the Orient. There are scores of Syrians in long coats and trousers, some wearing red fezes, and others having turbans or handkerchiefs wrapped around their heads. There are Turkish officers in uniform with swords at their sides, fez cap boys in silk gowns, and other Moslems in turbans and gowns. There are Mohammedan women clad all in black and wearing black veils. There are pretty Greek girls with bare faces, brown-skinned women from the mountains, and Bedouins who have ropes tied about the kerchiefs which half shroud their fierce features. There are also Persians, Druze, and Christians of all sorts and conditions. The trains go slowly in climbing the mountain. The average express makes less than 16 miles an hour, while the mixed train takes 12 hours to make the 91 miles. For many years, the European powers have been scheming for the right to build railroads in this part of the world. One of the biggest and most talked of projects is a line to open the rich valley of the Euphrates, where Babylon and Nineveh once flourished. It has some of the best lands on the face of the globe, and it has been suggested that it was the site of the Garden of Eden. The British are especially interested in the project because of their irrigation plans for Mesopotamia, headed by Sir William Wilcox, the engineer for the Aswan Dam, which has redeemed about 7 million acres in Egypt. The Germans won out in the scramble for the concession to build the road to Baghdad. The line was divided into sections, and the Germans pushed on the work rapidly. Another concession to part of this line was granted by the Sultan to a group of Americans, but their plans fell through. As to the resources to be developed by these new roads, they are beyond description enormous. They include rich deposits of coal, oil, and other minerals. Asia Minor is rich agriculturally. The plains of Mesopotamia will raise anything that can be grown in Egypt, and the new irrigation schemes will make them as productive as they were when Nebuchadnezzar was reigning at Babylon. In ancient times, that country had a population of more than six million. It has not one-fourth as many today. I am told that cotton will grow not only there, but also throughout Asia Minor, and it may be that one of the chief competitors of our southern plantations will eventually be found in this now almost waste but potentially rich part of the world. The famous Berlin to Baghdad scheme is not the only evidence of the German Kaiser's desire to gobble up as much of the Near East as possible. I use the word gobble advisedly. According to the Century Dictionary, it means to swallow in large pieces, to swallow hastily, to seize upon with greed, and to appropriate graspingly. And that aptly describes the German methods. I have seen German culture at work all during this trip. In the richest parts of Palestine, I saw their flourishing colonies. At Jerusalem, I saw the great German church built under the very shadow of the Holy Sepulcher, their huge church on Mount Zion beyond the Tower of David, and the enormous limestone hospice erected in honor of Kaiser and Augusta on a commanding slope of the Mount of Olives. It is said that the money with which the site was bought and some of that used in the building was a silver wedding present to the empress. It was known that she greatly loved Palestine, and her friends planned this memorial as a silver wedding gift. 
the hospice is several hundred feet above jerusalem and standing upon its roof on a bright day one can look across the hills of judea and see the silvery thread of the jordan and the shining dead sea with the blue mountains of moab beyond the kaiser was no respecter of persons either living or dead the site of his big church was purchased by him of sultan abdul hamid when he visited him in constantinople he went there on his way to the holy land and while hobnobbing with the sultan got him to sell him this tract for twenty four thousand dollars the land however was not large enough so the germans by a clever trick purchased for sixteen thousand dollars the american cemetery which adjoined the original tract the emperor of germany when he made his trip through the holy land created as great a sensation as theodore roosevelt when he cavorted through europe kaiser wilhelm and his empress started in at beirut and crossed the mountains of lebanon to baalbek and damascus they then returned to beirut and took ship down the coast past tyre and sidon to the bay of Accra. here horses were waiting for them and they rode down around the slopes of mount carmel over the plains of sharon to jaffa and thence up the hills of judea to jerusalem there were about a thousand in the party and it required one thousand two hundred and fifty mules and horses to carry them and their baggage the emperor himself had a staff of one hundred and twenty who ate at his own tables and there were in addition one hundred and forty naval and military officers the empress also had her ladies-in-waiting with her one hundred and seventy-five high turks and officials were supplied by the sultan as a special escort the emperor's tour was so arranged that he had four camps he slept in a different camp every night and had a new one for each meal although the journey was made in october the weather was hot and the chief trouble was to supply the expedition with water some died of thirst and between haifa and jaffa six horses dropped dead of sunstroke it was so hot that the trip to the dead sea and the jordan was not attempted but the emperor went to bethlehem and other places nearby he remained seven days at jerusalem during which time he consummated his purchases of land in palestine i encountered a german tourist agency a competitor of thomas cook and son this tourist agency had its own hotels at jaffa jerusalem and haifa and its own guides dragomans horses and carriages its men who thoroughly understood the country had established such relations with the bedouin tribes that they could take parties anywhere the agency's road mending and other activities had opened up many hitherto inaccessible parts of the country indeed the germans started a new roads movement in the holy land the first attempt was made when the kaiser went from jaffa to jerusalem the sultan had the highway repaired and when the germans traveled over it it was watered for the first time in its history being sprinkled from skin bags carried from the shoulders of women and girls and filled at the springs wells and cisterns nearby End of chapter 29chapter thirty of the holy land and syria by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b american leaven in the near east american education is revolutionizing the orient it has been one of the chief modernizing forces in egypt it had much to do with the revolution in persia and it is the basis of the reorganization of the whole turkish empire the first schools of egypt were started by the missionaries of the united presbyterian church whose educational institutions now cover the nile valley this church has schools in the sudan and a great american college at asyut several hundred miles from cairo the college was started in a donkey stable more than forty years ago and it has been turning out graduates ever since it has now more than one thousand students who are housed in ten large two-story buildings and it has three of the finest halls to be found in the east these are situated just outside as yet at the junction of the nile with the great canal north of that city the college has about three hundred women i visited the college at as yet not long ago 
it is full to overflowing and notwithstanding the new structure just completed it needs more money and more buildings it has a great prestige throughout egypt and with a little money its efficiency could easily be doubled the college is said to give a better education than the government institutions and that at the lowest possible cost the tuition is nominal for the poorest schools it is only about one dollar a term in money and the ordinary rate is about ten dollars a year the cost of the education varies with the taste of the students these are of all classes from the sons of the poorest fellah to the heir of the highest pasha or richest merchant there are three kinds of accommodations the cost of which ranges from thirty five dollars a year upward the wealthy egyptian boy can have his own room or groups can live four in a room he can eat at the best table or he can get cheaper board with meat three or four times a week on the other hand he can work his way through college furnishing his own food buying vegetables and fish at very low cost many of the boys bring their bread from home it is made of ground corn or millet and baked in cakes an inch thick these cakes are toasted until they are as hard as stone in which shape they will go through the term before going to a meal the students dip their bread in buckets of water set out for the purpose and when it is soft carry it with them to the table the asyut institution has its graduates in all the government departments of egypt they are among the leading merchants of the country and every town has numbers of them many of them are copts and not a few are mohammedans i am told that there are more than fifteen thousand boys now being educated in the united presbyterian schools and colleges shortly before sultan abdul hamid was ousted by the young turk party and carried to his prison in saloniki he referred bitterly to the work that robert college had done in unsettling his empire said he that institution has cost me bulgaria and it is like to lose me my throne he was right robert college was founded in constantinople in eighteen sixty three by a new york merchant named robert who gave a large part of his fortune to this institution he was aided by the rev cyrus hamlin d d who was i think the real organizer since then its graduates have formed the leaven for new ideas throughout the near east some of its graduates organize the colleges and schools in bulgaria others have been teaching in schools throughout the turkish empire many have acted as officers of the government and some of the best leaders of turkey today got their education at robert college robert college has now five hundred or six hundred students including mohammedans jews armenians and russians as well as representatives of the other nations about the teaching is non-sectarian although all are required to attend daily prayers and go to services on sunday the college has won the approval of the government but the officials want it incorporated as a turkish institution so it will be subject to their laws to this the americans naturally object they say that they are organized under the laws of new york and they expect to stand by all the rights which they now enjoy as an american corporation under the protection of the united states government there is no doubt that the americans are sensible in preferring the protection of uncle sam to that of the sultan conditions are bound to be unsettled in this part of the world for years to come there will be revolutions and counter-revolutions before the turks come down to a solid substantial modern government there is always the fear that the college will be put under a strict censorship as used to be the case as it is now the students can read what books they like and there is little trouble as to the newspapers they can go where they please without passports and the present government seems to be doing all it can to promote education under the regime of abdul hamid it was far different in his time every newspaper was carefully looked over by turkish officials and all sentences or words objectionable to the government were cut out this was true of papers coming in through the mail as well as of the native publications here in beirut a sunday weekly is published devoted largely to the life and sayings of our saviour the censors objected to it saying the paper is a dangerous one for in it they kill a king of the jews every week this might suggest the assassination of the sultan and we cannot permit it dr bliss the president of the american university of beirut 
once imported an old copy of shakespeare it was kept at the customs house the censor objecting to its importation said the latter shakespeare is not a good book for the turks it has in it the story of a man named macbeth who killed a king it would be a bad example for our people dr bliss succeeded in getting his shakespeare through by saying he had another copy of the same book which as it was already in the country could not be taken out and he would be glad to trade this for the new copy the censor consented accepted the shakespeare which cost a dollar and admitted the fine old edition instead at another time some new testaments sent to constantinople were held back by one of the censors because of the epistle of paul to the galatians galata is one of the divisions of constantinople and the censor asked who is this man paul and why is he writing to our people in galata he was with difficulty persuaded that st paul was dead and that his letter was not part of a plot there is a story that a textbook on chemistry was kept out because a censor objected to the term h two o saying that it seemed to mean that hamid the second the sultan abdul hamid amounted to nothing in addition to robert college and the institution at asyut there is one here at beirut which is quite as important as either of the others i refer to the american university of beirut founded by americans in eighteen sixty three which has become the harvard and yale of the near east it has had thousands of graduates and its doctors and lawyers stand at the heads of their professions in egypt syria turkey persia and india it has more than nine hundred students all orientals representing every part of the levant this institution was founded by presbyterians but the instruction is non-sectarian the faculty has about one hundred and twenty professors most of them americans and it is a thoroughly up-to-date university it has a medical department which with its hospitals treats thousands of patients a year it has physical chemical and other laboratories a large library and ethnological and industrial museums devoted to exhibits from syria and turkey during my stay here i have visited the college it is beautifully located the buildings being situated on the bluffs south of beirut and running from them down to the sea standing upon the campus which contains about fifty acres one faces the glorious mediterranean while at his back are the snow-capped mountains of lebanon with the rich vegetation climbing their slopes the institution has a gymnasium tennis courts and good athletic grounds its students play football baseball and cricket they are full of college spirit and have their college papers their college songs and their college yell the boys have silver cups and other trophies which are contended for by the various athletic teams and these persians greeks syrians arabs egyptians armenians and turks are being welded into one brotherhood by the hard knocks of football and the track the beirut university is an american college and a christian college as well but it does not attempt to proselytize and the muslim can come to it without changing his religion it insists only that every one who goes through its courses shall attend chapel and the bible classes which study the bible as one of the great influences in the work of the world once the moslem students struck against these regulations they refused to go to chapel and took an oath not to attend the bible classes the strike created a sensation and for a time it seemed as though it might do serious damage the faculty however headed by the president dr howard s bliss stood firm saying that the school was a christian college they demanded that all students attend the religious services and the result was that most of the strikers came in and the college has gone along on its original lines in talking about this to the mohammedan students dr bliss said our college was established to give the mohammedan world the best the christian world has our aim is to make of you broad-minded intelligent men whether you continue to be moslems or become christians we believe that the best thing we have is our religion so we are bound to let you know what it is whether you accept it or not rests with yourselves if upon investigation you still think the moslem religion the best we believe that the knowledge you have of our religion will make you better and broader moslems religion is for man not man for religion 
and we want you to have the training which will make each one of you the best man whether he be christian or moslem today the mohammedan students attending the services look upon them as largely educational and they study the bible as history and literature the influence of colleges like this goes far and wide the students come from villages all over the turkish empire and from those of india and persia as well going home each forms a little hotbed for the growth of independent thought civilized ideas are spread in other ways besides these one of the great means of such distribution is the annual pilgrimage to mecca which is attended by nearly half a million mohammedans from all parts of the orient at that time mecca becomes a great camp meeting or bush meeting such as we farmers have in virginia the people come together and gossip they discuss the crops and ask one another how they are getting along hassan ali of egypt says to mohammed of turkey how is business are you making money and how does your government treat you mohammed replies that the turks are taxed to death but they hope for much under the new sultan thereupon hassan says that the english have cut down the taxes in egypt and that the church has plenty of money in the treasury he tells how he has been able to send his boy to college and that he hopes he will some day be an official the turk thereupon longs for a better government at the same time the college students tell what they have learned and as a result the twentieth century spirit of modern progress is stirring the mohammedan world in addition to the collegiate work great advances in the spread of our civilization are being made by the protestant missions there are now thousands of native christians in syria and from seventy five to one hundred thousand native christians in the empire of turkey the american missionaries alone have more than one hundred schools with five or six thousand pupils and the english have many more here in beirut is the largest and most up-to-date publishing house in the orient it belongs to the american mission and annually turns out tens of thousands of bibles school textbooks and other works on religious and scientific subjects altogether it has published more than seven hundred different works in arabic and it is estimated that it has printed in the neighborhood of a billion pages of one kind or other it issues around one hundred thousand volumes a year containing altogether something like thirty million pages its bibles published in arabic are sold throughout the mohammedan world the medical missionaries are doing a great deal in all parts of the orient i have seen their hospitals everywhere on my trips around the world they are to be found in all parts of india far up the nile valley and in the leading centers of the holy land one of the best i have visited is situated at tiberias on the sea of galilee and headed by dr torrance who has been treating the bedouins and others there for the last thirty years in my talk with him the question of tuberculosis came up and he described the evils of the great white plague as they are found in his region on the very edge of the desert he says tuberculosis is rife among the bedouins although they live out of doors in the purest air all the time he thinks that the disease is spread largely by the cattle about fifty per cent of the cows have tuberculosis and the people live chiefly on milk another doctor connected with the hospital tells me that syria had no consumption until about twenty-five years ago when the disease was brought in from the united states by natives who had emigrated to our country contracted consumption and brought it back home the syrians had no idea what it meant and it rapidly spread the sanitary conditions of this part of the world are bad the bacteria breed rapidly and the disease is sweeping the country and this brings me to a great work at juno within a few miles of beirut this is a tuberculosis hospital built there by the church of the covenant at washington and in charge of dr mary eddy who has become famous through the near east for her work as a medical missionary miss eddy is the daughter of the rev william w eddy who came to syria many years ago and remained here until his death besides being a woman of fine education and great medical skill she is an expert on all matters connected with tuberculosis and its treatment she is the only woman who has ever been granted an irade or certificate of protection from the sultan authorizing her to practice as a doctor 
everywhere throughout his dominions and directing that all good turks shall give her assistance as she goes on her way miss eddy has been working in syria for years and has been fighting the spread of consumption as best she could without any hospital facilities for her patients the people have come and camped near her house waiting treatment and the tents of the bedouins may be seen dotting the plains near where the hospital now is some of the best known men and women of our national capital have been interested in the building of this hospital and the support of its work end of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of the holy land and syria by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b at the shrine of diana of the ephesians this morning we shall walk through the remains of the famed city of the ephesians we shall wander over the site of the great temple of diana tramp the ground where st john was living when he wrote his gospel and stand in the marble market-place where st paul preached there is a tradition that the mother of our lord is buried here and that here lies also the dust of st timothy the ephesus of the past has been brought to the light of the present by the excavations of the austrians i have told you something of their work in the holy land and especially on the site of old jericho they have also dug up the ruins of other cities in asia and here at ephesus have uncovered what remains of the temple of diana and found a theatre which had seats for thirty thousand persons they have excavated the marble docks which led up to the city and have done much to show us what this great commercial centre of two thousand years ago must have been in the height of its glory but first let me tell you something of the ephesus of the days of st paul it lay here on the coast of asia minor just opposite greece in what was almost the centre of the then known world it was the chief roman city of asia it had a population of a million or more and was famous for its learning art and beautiful buildings it was far more magnificent than smyrna which was founded before it and in which it is said the poet homer was born ephesus dated back to a thousand years before christ some say it was founded by the amazons but we know that it was largely built up by greeks from the ionian islands over the way it was a great city in the days of croesus who besieged the town in the year five hundred ten b c and later it grew so famous that alexander the great wanted to change its name for his own among the wonders of ephesus was its temple to diana the favorite goddess of the city people from the corners of the earth came to worship her her temple was considered one of the seven wonders of the world it covered more than two acres and its mighty roof was upheld by one hundred and twenty-seven marble columns each as high as a six-story building the worship of the goddess was so famous that there grew up a business in making statues of her and manufacturing portable shrines which could be carried away by pilgrims athletic games were connected with the worship and the month of may was sacred to her the temple itself is referred to in the scriptures in the acts we read of the great goddess diana whom all asia and the world worshipped now let us have a look at the site of that temple today. we have taken a special car at smyrna and have been pulled by a little french locomotive over the railroad to the station of ayasoluk forty-eight miles away across country we have gone through a land of vineyards and olives where baggy trousered peasants are pruning the vines and working the fields they dig about the trees with three tined hoes and till their crops with donkeys and bullocks the one-handled ploughs are about the same as those used in ancient days we go over the plains which must have fed the ephesians wind our way in and out through the hills and finally come to a little station where we get horses to carry us out through the valley to ephesus the site of the temple lies in a valley it is not far above the level of the sea which we can see shining in the sun not more than five miles away history says it was swampy and that the great structure was erected upon piles this statement is borne out by the present conditions of the site the excavation made in uncovering the ruins is now filled with water it is a miniature lake filled with broken columns 
and capitals lying half in and half out of the water we stand on the banks beside fluted columns of snow-white marble and see broken marble everywhere near that man who ploughs on the southern ridge of the sand turns up marble bits at every step of his bullocks and the girls behind him who are planting uncover stones from the temple at almost every stroke of their hoes as we look we see no sign of the activity which prevailed here two thousand years ago birds fly across the lake and sing in the trees bending over it a stork sits sleepily on a marble rock in its midst and a frog croaks out a welcome a red cow is grazing there on the edge of the water and at my right a hog is rooting in the debris let us get on our horses and ride on down the valley to visit the theatre which once held the actors of the chief playhouse of asia think of a theatre seating thirty thousand it is only in recent years that we have built in the united states amphitheatres large enough to seat as many people as used to watch the performances here more than two thousand years ago this great open-air structure was built largely of marble and altogether of stone the entrance to the stage was through tunnels and the stage was upheld by marble columns the seats which were made of common stone covered with marble ran around the stage or rather the pit in the shape of a half moon rising high up the hills at the back they were in three stories and contained sixty-six rows i measured the outline of the stage it was about eighteen feet wide and six or seven feet high there are long underground passages leading to it and there were eight dressing rooms on two floors at the sides of the stage walking through the pit now filled with broken marble columns and blocks of marble beautifully carved i climbed down now and then and tried to imagine the audience and the acting going on upon the marble stage far below leaving the theatre i strolled about through the wide streets of marble which had been partially uncovered and made photographs of bits of the ruins there is enough of this fine stone here to build a structure equal to our national capital at washington this is mixed with mosaic and the broken statues of the palaces of the past there are pieces of friezes columns and capitals lying out in the open there are torsos of statues the heads and feet of which have been broken off and carried away and also many exquisite carvings which would be treasures to any museum here lies a piece of marble drapery the remnants of the garment of a goddess there the broken-up limb of an athlete and farther on a beautiful bit from the front of the temple among the ruins are the remains of stores houses and markets i climbed over marble blocks along the street which led to the ship canal and stood among broken columns in what was once the stock exchange and wool market in one place is an artificial terrace where stood the great gymnasium and in another is a market-place two hundred feet long surrounded by a portico back of which were the stalls of the market men in the mosaic floors of these stalls thirteen different kinds of marbles were used and marbles of various colors were employed throughout the structure today the peasants are working all over these ruins here they are planting grain and there cleaning the fields is a gang of a dozen girls working under a turbaned man in baggy trousers here women are digging farther on a man drives a camel harnessed to a one-handled plough the only town near ephesus is iasoluk which has but a few hundred habitants it has perhaps a dozen small stores a railroad station and a hotel while at the station i saw a white fat lamb awaiting shipment it was tied to the platform and a card fastened to one horn bore the name of the commission merchant in smyrna to whom it was consigned just opposite the hotel are seven tall columns which once supported the great aqueduct which supplied ephesus with water each of these has now a stork's nest on its top and the great birds may be seen any day standing there i am told that they come here only for the winter and that they leave every spring for holland or perhaps for some other far-away part of the world every one of them carrying a baby before coming to ephesus i spent a day in smyrna whither i shall return to go on to constantinople and greece smyrna is the largest city in asia minor and has about the same position in the modern world 
that ephesus once had the chief port of this part of the levant it does a big business in shipping wool wine grapes olives and figs it has a foreign trade of about fifty million dollars a year and steamers from all parts of the mediterranean come to its docks the city lies at one end of the gulf of smyrna which is thirty-four miles long and surrounded by lofty silver-gray mountains some of them a mile high its harbor is excellent and the town has many modern buildings because of its importance in the trade of asia minor smyrna is a center of political and commercial interests and the scene of fierce competition among the various nationalities among its people there are more greeks than turks while traveling in syria i saw many openings for american goods the farming there is after the methods of centuries ago and our plows reapers and other agricultural machines might be sold i understand that the more progressive of the native landlords are ready to buy one man who owns more than a thousand acres of rich grain land on the high plateau between the two ranges of the lebanon mountains has offered seventy five per cent of the profits to any american company that will cultivate it for two or three years and will bring in american machinery the landlord also agrees upon the termination of the lease to pay for the machinery at the regular price some of the syrian farmers are now using american threshers and reapers and some are bringing in american plows the first thresher imported was upon the advice of our consul general at beirut he is a dakota man who understands the farming conditions in the northwest he tells me that the possibilities of raising grain in this part of the world are remarkable and that dry farming might be practiced in many localities which now go to waste he thinks that old mesopotamia can be reclaimed by irrigation and a new egypt created there he says that as political conditions improve there will be many opportunities for commerce and industry and that american capital should take advantage of the situation syria and asia minor are now raising a great deal of silk which is sent to france and shipped from there to the united states the american residents tell me that there is no reason why we should not buy this raw silk direct thus saving the frenchman's profits and the double transportation charges i saw mulberry orchards everywhere during my travels in syria the plains about beirut are covered with them and they are to be found on both sides of the lebanon mountains when the trees have grown to the height of a man's head they are cut back green leaves from the new sprouts furnish food for millions of silkworms in coming from damascus i saw women and children picking the leaves to feed to the worms carrying them to sheds erected for the purpose raising the silkworms is largely in the hands of the women who take care of the trees and sell the cocoons from the lebanon mountain regions every year men specially appointed go to france to get the silkworm eggs for some reason those laid in the syrian mountains do not produce well he who plants an olive tree lays up riches for his children's children this saying expresses a current belief throughout the levant olives are the money crop of a great part of palestine syria and asia minor many of the trees are hundreds of years old and some of them were planted before columbus discovered america i am told of an orchard near tripoli in syria which the deeds show was established about five hundred years ago and the trees of which are still bearing all the way from jerusalem to the sea of galilee i saw olive trees that looked old enough to have been planted by jacob some of gigantic size were hollow and had been filled with stones to aid in their support many of the colonists of the holy land have set out new orchards and the americans who live at haifa have trees bearing fruit every year i am told that the crop is very profitable and that under reduced taxation many more trees will be planted the fruit is raised for the oil a ton of olives yields about seventy gallons of oil asia minor already leads the world in its production of olive oil producing about two or three hundred thousand more barrels per annum than either spain or italy another big crop of the region about smyrna is the fig which grows better here than in almost any other part of the globe more than three hundred thousand camel loads are raised in some years 
and they are shipped all over the world the trees begin to bear in their sixth year and are at their best ten years after planting the figs ripen about the first of august and when fully matured fall to the ground they are dried in the sun then packed in bags for the market a great many of these figs go to america where you will find them in all the fruit and grocery stores our part of the crop is carefully packed there being several american firms here which do nothing else the figs are first sorted according to the thickness of the skin and size of the fruit the poorest are thrown away or used for distilling purposes and the best are put up for export in boxes and jars the price here varies from two to eight cents a pound the very finest of the figs bringing the latter figure a great deal of the packing is done in the city of smyrna to which the fruit is brought in from all parts of the country some of it comes on the railways on cars especially built for the traffic and some is carried on camels as it is important that the fruit be not bruised that carried in the cars is laid upon shelves built one above the other so that there is no danger of the figs being crushed or bruised end of chapter thirty one chapter thirty two of the holy land and syria this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b the holy land and syria by frank g carpenter armenia the suffering armenia is the job among peoples her frightful sufferings seem to have no end a little christian island in a vast sea of mohammedanism she has been swept by one great tidal wave of persecution after another before the eyes of the modern world in the nineteenth and twentieth centuries even a whole people has been robbed exiled and murdered while the great nations have looked on apparently helpless to bring to a permanent end the horrible atrocities committed by the unspeakable turk millions of dollars have been spent in the past for the aid of armenia millions more will be required before she is freed from famine and persecution vast sums have been donated by americans through their churches and missionary societies the red cross and other national and international organizations to help these people in their misery but lasting relief cannot come until armenia is enabled to set up a nation of her own once more or it is brought under the protection of a strong christian power what the armenians have done under oppression shows that they have great possibilities as a race they are sometimes called the yankees of the orient they are the brightest brainiest and shrewdest of all the people of asia minor in business they are sharper than the jews or even the greeks the turks say twist a yankee and you make a jew twist a jew and you make an armenian the greeks say that one greek is equal to two jews but one armenian is equal to two greeks another current turkish proverb is from the greeks of athens from the jews of saloniki and from the armenians everywhere good lord deliver us the armenians are by no means confined to one part of the orient i have met them everywhere in the east and i have found them acting as heads of all kinds of businesses there are many rich armenians in india coming from singapore to calcutta i travelled with a wealthy armenian jeweller who told me he was on his way back from hong kong where he had gone to sell pearls to the chinese i found armenian conductors on the egyptian railways and when i went over the transcontinental railroad to paris the guards on the train and the men who took up my tickets were armenians who speak english and french there are hundreds of thousands of armenians in europe there are a large number in persia and in different parts of turkey there are said to be about one million there are a great many in constantinople where they manage most of the banking business and own large mercantile establishments when i get money on my letter of credit in constantinople it was an armenian clerk who figured out the exchange and an armenian cashier who handed out the money whenever there are riots in that city nearly all the stores are closed because their armenian owners fear they may be looted by the mob 
when i visited the turkish government departments i found that the chief officers were turks the clerks were in most cases armenians and the cleverest man i met in turkey was one of the sultan's secretaries a man of armenian birth there are also armenian engineers architects and doctors in constantinople the armenians of armenia proper however are almost all farmers most of whom have become poverty-stricken through the exorbitant taxes of the sultan at jerusalem i saw a large number of armenian pilgrims who had come from all parts of asia minor to pray at the church of the holy sepulchre they have a patriarch at jerusalem who leads them in these celebrations he is a tall thin man with a long gray beard and a face not unlike that of the typical georgia cracker he usually wears a long gown and has a little skull cap on the crown of his head during the easter celebration he wears a tiara blazing with diamonds and his gown is a gorgeous silk robe decorated with diamonds the armenian christians have doctrines much like those of the greek church they have monasteries and churches scattered throughout asia minor armenia was the first country in the world to adopt christianity as a state religion this she did at the beginning of the fourth century and twelve years before the conversion of the roman emperor constantine ever since she has been persecuted by a succession of enemies and conquerors of other faiths almost as soon as christianity had been adopted the armenians were commanded by the persians their overlords at that time to give up their faith and adopt the persian religion of fire worship they replied no one can move us from our belief neither angels nor men fire nor sword here below we will choose no other god and in heaven no other lord but jesus christ and they have stuck to their declaration through all the horrors and persecutions brought upon them by persians saracens tartars mamelukes and turks at her height armenia was a flourishing country with a population of some thirty millions but from the time of the great dispersal that resulted from the invasion of the moslem hordes in the seventh century the armenians like the jews have been decimated their country has been ravaged and the people have been scattered all over europe and asia the armenians assert that their country is the holiest land upon earth it lies in asia minor southeast of the black sea and between it and persia mount ararat is situated in armenia and some of the monasteries claim to have pieces of the identical ark in which noah landed upon this mountain a ravine nearby is pointed out as the site of noah's vineyard the vineyard has a monastery connected with it and the monks show a withered old vine which they assert is the very one from which noah brewed the wine that made him drunk he cursed it so effectually after he got over his spree that it has borne no grapes unto this day noah's wife is said to be buried on mount ararat the armenians trace their ancestry back to japheth in one great genealogical tree they also have a tradition that the garden of eden was located in armenia almost in the center of the region where the worst massacres have occurred but it is now one of the barren parts of the country the armenians believe that the wise men of the east who followed the star of bethlehem to find the young christ came from their country and that the star first appeared in the heavens not far from mount ararat according to another curious armenian tradition when adam was in the garden of eden his body was covered with nails like those we have on our fingers and toes these nails overlapped each other like the scales of a fish thus giving him an invulnerable armor after the fall they all dropped off except those from the ends of his fingers and toes they remain to this day to remind man of his lost immortality the armenians say that when god made adam of clay he had a little piece left over he threw this upon the ground and as it fell it became gold and formed all the gold of the world these people are devoted to the bible and take their religion very seriously they could have made their peace with the turks long long ago if they had been willing to accept mohammedanism the condition of the women of armenia is said to be terrible they have no refuge from the turks 
who perpetrate all sorts of outrages upon them in some of the armenian cities during one of the massacres the girls were collected into the churches and kept there for days at the pleasure of the soldiers before they were murdered one statement described how sixty young brides were so treated and how the blood ran out under the church doors at the time of their massacre these armenian women are among the most attractive of the near east i have seen a number of them during my trip through asia minor they have large dark luminous eyes with long eyelashes and rich creamy complexions many of them have rosy cheeks and luscious red lips they are tall and straight but become fat soon after marriage not a few of them are married to turks these women have a dress of their own they wear red fez caps with long tassels much like some of the country girls of greece the richer ladies wear loose jackets lined with fur and long plain skirts of silk or fine wool in the province of van where many atrocities have been committed the girls wear under their skirts trousers which are tied at the ankles some have long sleeveless jackets or cloaks reaching almost to the feet and open at the sides up to the waists and others wear gorgeous headdresses covering the front of their caps with gold coins which hang down over their foreheads like the jewesses these girls often wear their whole dowries on their persons and in massacres like those which have so often occurred rings are torn from the ears arms are cut off for bracelets and many a woman is killed for her jewelry the poorer women are hard workers nearly every household has some kind of home industry whereby it adds to its income some of the finest embroideries we get from turkey are made by these clever armenian women the best of the work being done by hand in hovels the houses in which the armenians live are different in different countries in many of the cities of turkey there is an armenian quarter and the older armenian houses of smyrna are built like forts they have no windows facing the street and only of late years when the people have considered themselves safe from religious riots have they built houses more like the turks in armenia itself the poorer classes have homes which would be considered hardly fit for cows in america the cow in fact lives with the family the houses are all of one story and it is not uncommon to build a house against the side of a hill in order to save the making of a back wall the roofs are flat and are often covered with earth upon which grass and flowers grow and upon which the sheep are sometimes pastured the floors are usually sunken below the level of the roadway and the ordinary window is about the size of a porthole you go down steps to enter the house where you find a cow stable on one side and the kitchen and living quarters of the family on the other all the living arrangements are of the simplest and cheapest description each room has a stone fireplace where the cooking is done with cow dung mixed with straw there are no tables and very few chairs the animal heat of the cattle aids the fire in keeping the family warm the houses of the better class are more comfortable and in the big turkish cities some of the rich armenians have beautiful homes the armenian women are good housekeepers and much more cleanly than the turks even their hovels are kept clean they have a better home life than the turks a man can have but one wife but the families of several generations often live in one house if the daughter-in-law lives with them she is to a large extent the servant of her husband's family she has to obey her father-in-law and during the first days of her married life is not allowed to speak to her husband's parents or any of the family who are older than herself until her father-in-law gives her permission up to this time she wears a red veil as a badge of her subjection which is often kept on until her first baby is born armenian girls are married very young eleven or twelve is considered quite old enough and women still young often have sons twenty years old marriages are arranged by parents or by go-betweens the usual wedding day is monday and on the friday before the marriage the bride is taken to the bath with great ceremony on saturday she gives a big feast to her girl friends on sunday there is a feast for the boys and on monday the wedding takes place it usually occurs at the church where the priest blesses the ring and makes prayers over the wedding garments 
the numerous other ceremonies make the wedding last from three to eight days shortly after her return from the church the children present rush to pull off the bride's stockings in which have been hidden some coins for the occasion another curious custom is to place a baby boy on the knee of the bride as she sits beside the groom on a divan with the wish that she may become a happy mother while one reason for the hatred of the armenians is envy of their shrewdness and their wealth the chief cause of the turkish outrages is religious fanaticism the better classes of the turks and the more intelligent of the mohammedans would probably stop them if they could many of the high officials are afraid of the religious zeal of the people they realize that if the common people get the idea that they are false to their religion they are almost sure of assassination the imams and the sheiks or in other words the moslem priests are to a large extent the rulers of turkey they are in most cases ignorant and intolerant among the mohammedan fanatics there are a large number known as dervishes who roam about from place to place stirring up trouble they are walking delegates as it were for the killing of christians they stimulate the religious zeal of the people and make violent speeches against unbelievers they fast much and they have strange forms of worship one class known as the whirling dervishes may be seen in constantinople any friday going through their devotions they dress in long white robes fastened at the waists with black belts and wear high sugar-loaf hats they sing the koran as they whirl about in the mosques as they go on the chief priest makes prayers and they whirl faster and faster until at last their long skirts stand out like those of a ballet dancer their faces become crimson and some finally fall to the ground in fits another class of these fanatics are the howlers who have a great organization in turkey and have probably been largely concerned in inciting feeling against the armenians i have visited their mosques but i despair of adequately describing their religious gymnastics they work themselves into a frenzy jumping and bending and gasping and howling out the name of god the dervishes of the interior parts of turkey often take knives and cut themselves and each other in religious ecstasy they go into fits and foam at the mouth and most of them think that the killing of a christian is a sure passport to heaven i would say however that these people are the cranks of mohammedanism and that they are not a fair sample of the moslem world nevertheless they have had no small part in bringing about the miseries of armenia End of chapter thirty two chapter thirty three of the holy land and syria by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b palestine and syria under new rulers switch on your radiophone and let us listen together this evening to a talk from jerusalem where john bull sits in the seats of the mighty and the voice of the terrible turk is no more heard in the land the holy city is quiet the women are sitting as of old on the housetops under the stars while across the valley on the mount of olives sparks from the wireless tower flash out to the corners of our modern world if we listen carefully we may hear the familiar chug chug of an american automobile whose driver tomorrow will take a party of pilgrims over the road to bethlehem or perhaps he will start on the longer trip to the ruins of old jericho and the river jordan or even a tour of all the holy land most of which can now be reached in a motor car as we listen we learn that the high commissioner who rules in the name of his britannic majesty met to-day with his advisory council representing the people of palestine from the report of their proceedings we learn what is going on in the reborn promised land this council has ten members appointed by the commissioner four of them are moslems who make up four-fifths of the population of palestine three are jews identified with the zionist movement and three are christians just as the membership of this advisory council is divided among the three groups for whom jerusalem is a holy place and a religious center so too are the positions in the government today held by christians 
jews and mohammedans there are three official languages arabic english and hebrew the government we are told is in good condition and the country is self-supporting paying its way out of its revenues nevertheless the taxes with which the turks used to squeeze and harness the people have been reduced and some of them have been abolished at the same time where the turk and his tax gatherers as the arabs say never gave us so much as a drink of cold water the new rulers are providing much needed improvements with the public funds before the british came the arabs had a saying that the turk would rule the holy land until the nile flowed into palestine this ancient prophecy has been almost literally fulfilled for when the british built the military railroad from egypt into palestine they laid all the way beside it a pipeline carrying water pumped from the nile a great tank in the hills on the hebron road built by pontius pilate had been restored and now holds five million gallons of water which is piped into jerusalem the streets have been cleaned the beginnings of a sewerage system put in and the natives have started to learn the use of a covered garbage can even the mosquitoes descendants of those who bit the crusaders have been driven out and have gone to the other side of jordan to smite the bedouins plans for the further extension of the city beyond the walls have been prepared and its growth will be directed accordingly a native police force has been recruited to keep order in the place of the troops which have been gradually reduced in number all the holy places are still carefully protected the british were able to keep the mosque of omar under moslem guard by using soldiers from their own indian troops made up of followers of the prophet the men of a new zealand regiment who were masons held a meeting in the secret cavern under the holy rock in the mosque said to be the place where king solomon founded their order there were thirty-two masons from twenty-seven different lodges who took part in this meeting while an old sheik acted as doorkeeper the differences in religion keep bobbing up in jerusalem giving the british and the advisory council some ticklish questions to deal with for example when the military band started to give concerts in a public square in the outer city they played three afternoons a week thursday saturday and sunday the great mufti head of the jerusalem moslems solemnly protested saying the band played saturday for the jewish sabbath and on sunday for the christians but was slighting the mohammedans who observe friday so now the bands play four days a week another thing the british did gratified the christians under turkish rule the church of the nativity at bethlehem was disfigured by a wall separating the greek choir and chancel from the nave and basilica which is common to orthodox and catholic alike this wall they tore down so that now the whole church is open to view as a result of the war and the cruelties of the turks the population of jerusalem shrank from eighty thousand to sixty thousand while jaffa was almost depopulated with british control however the people flocked back again and a rapid increase is expected all through the holy land the country itself suffered almost as much as the people from the outrages of both the turks and the germans crops were seized to feed the soldiers and the hundreds of thousands of olive and other trees were cut down to make fuel for locomotives the germans blasted out the trees with dynamite destroying the roots so that no sprouts could spring up whole sections of palestine were stripped bare and at the same time cattle and sheep were taken away and killed in some places the people burned nearly everything they had to keep the turks from getting their possessions the british are working on a vast scheme of reforestation in connection with their irrigation plans they are encouraging a project for building a dam in the river jordan above tiberius and the sea of galilee which will furnish power for irrigation pumps and light and energy for all palestine great nurseries have been established at gaza where samson threw down the temple of the philistines in one operation more than one hundred thousand timber trees and ninety thousand fruit trees were set out the new rulers of the holy land hope to restore agriculture which fell into decay under the turks chiefly on account of the excessive taxes on the farmers 
local meetings of natives have been held throughout the country to find out what the farmers needed most and to put them in touch with sources of supply there was found to be a great shortage of farm implements and machines such as mowers horse rakes and other equipment to encourage the natives the sum of two million five hundred thousand dollars was set aside to be loaned by the anglo-egyptian bank of palestine for improvements on their lands within three years after the war palestine agriculture produced more than two million bushels of wheat one million bushels of barley one and one quarter million bushels of millet six thousand tons of grapes and one hundred and fifty thousand gallons of olive oil the number of sheep and goats was estimated at more than a quarter of a million of each figs are grown in upper galilee but not so many as will be the case when shipping facilities are provided for the second year under british control the import trade of palestine amounted to not quite twenty million dollars most of which was with great britain and egypt the people import foodstuffs such as rice and sugar and buy a great quantity of cotton goods some think that palestine may become a second switzerland and grow rich on the visitors to the country for many years both pilgrims and tourists have been going to the holy land by the thousands but little has ever been done for either their comfort or their convenience with the country under good management by the british and modern conditions provided more people will want to make the trip many thousands of palestinians could undoubtedly be employed at a profit in serving the visitors and selling them goods communications in palestine have been greatly improved and extended besides the military railway from egypt general allenby and the british built more than two hundred miles of highways and these are being added to all the time there are now four hundred and eighty miles of railroad track and five hundred and twenty three miles of public highways the cars on the line from egypt to the holy land are comfortable and sleeping and eating accommodations are provided one may ride from cairo to ludd and there connect with the jaffa jerusalem line or continue on to haifa whence the journey may be continued for twelve hours over the french railroad to damascus every two weeks aeroplanes carry mail from egypt and palestine across the desert into mesopotamia where the british are developing the large interests they gain there as a result of the war the zionists have revived an old plan for a two hundred and fifty mile ship canal through palestine as a supplement to the suez canal but it does not seem likely that the scheme will be worked out with the british controlling palestine and the suez canal the british plan to extend into mesopotamia the railroad system already connecting palestine and egypt so as to link up the countries of three rivers the nile the jordan and the euphrates this will supplement the berlin to baghdad line which the germans thought would give them control over a new eastern empire another project that is now much talked of is to dig a tunnel thirty-seven miles long under the hills to carry water from the streams along the coast of the mediterranean into the jordan the fact that the jordan is far below sea level makes this physically possible even if not economically practicable extensive improvements are planned for haifa which as a port and the terminus of the railroads to damascus and jerusalem will be an important place in the future the british also expect to empty into ships at haifa the oil they plan to pipe across the desert from mesopotamia haifa used to be great in ancient days when it was the chief landing place of the crusaders and the transfer point in the early trade between venice and the far east it is now predicted that its population of twenty thousand will increase to one hundred thousand within ten years the french have a mandate for syria as the british have for palestine and the boundaries of both regions have been redrawn damascus is included in the territory under french control syria is nominally independent and the natives have not been altogether satisfied with the way the french have governed their country since the sultan's power was overthrown very little has been left of the turkish possessions as armenia has been declared independent and the greeks given a footing in smyrna and the surrounding district once these regions become adjusted to the new conditions following the war 
it is believed they will enter upon a new era of prosperity and rapid development of their many rich resources the end end of chapter thirty three end of the holy land and syria by frank g carpenter